Welcome everybody to the True Crime News. I'm Morgan Rector. And and I am an alien. I mean, I'm sorry, I'm just kidding. I wish I was. I'm Rachel Telfor. All right. So uh, my first story this week uh, is one that I didn't do last week because we were running a little over, you know, it was getting a bit long. Um, so it's about the dark web. Um, and it concerns predatory teachers in the digital age. It's interesting because, you know, that's, I mean, I imagine that's probably always been a problem. Like here in Canada, uh, we have these, we've had these residential schools where indigenous children were taken from their families and forced to convert to Christianity. Uh, they were not allowed to speak in their indigenous languages. Uh, and the punishment was like physical abuse, verbal abuse. They were also sexually abused and it's, uh, it's, quite, it's, quite a, it's quite a scandal, actually. And, nice. That's great. <clears throat> yeah, the point is, yeah, predatory teachers have always been around, and that's that's one of the Catholic churches. Uh, it's one matter they need to resolve still. But uh, in this day and age, uh, it's interesting, because suddenly we're hearing about all these females who are doing it. I know I ran across another I ran across a couple of stories actually researching this week and a couple of them were fem- like more than I've seen before. And so that's interesting. Yeah. And huh. some are, some of them are like attractive enough where I think why did you go after a 13-year-old boy? Right? Any guy your age? I don't know. There's, what is that? All uh, right. So, so as far as this story goes, uh 2 years ago former elementary school teacher Brittany Zamora captured America's attention for sexually grooming a sixth grade student. She's currently serving a 20 year sentence. So in 2018, uh, and she lived in Goodyear, Arizona, uh, she signed on to Instagram and sent a series of sexually explicit messages to a 13 year old boy in her class. Uh, Thinking about your sexy self, she wrote to that student. I want to uh, blank you so bad, I'll, I'll, I'll Assume she said fuck. I wanted to fuck oh. you so bad. By those times weren't enough for me, so she was clearly infatuated with him. Uh, but the child's father was watching. The boy's parents later confronted Zamora in a recorded phone call, which served as key evidence in her eventual sexual abuse trial. Uh, the, and the father asked her, "What type of fucking pervert person, perverted person are you? I want to know right now. You are a fucking monster." You are a pedophile. You're a child molester. Do you understand that? So in March 2018, the then 27-year-old married educator was arrested and charged with eight counts of sexual conduct with a minor, two counts of child molestation, and one count of transmitting obscene material. The Arizona teacher's sex scandal quickly rippled through America. Um... Uh, someone named Bree Burkett, who is a reporter for the Arizona Republic, said it was just a case that was so sensational and it was so salacious. The second you see that mugshot released in her name and age, it just blew up. Zamora groomed the boy for months using mobile messaging apps and later pursued a sexual relationship with him. However, the 13-year-old's phone was being monitored by his parents. Sentry, a parental control app, later caught a number of flirtatious messages between Zamora and her underage student. Maybe you should get your son's uh, Sentry. Maybe you should look. They at- don't even have phone numbers yet, so. Oh, they don't have phones yet. <laughs> they have phones. They're just they're not. They they can only use Wi-Fi, so they they really can't talk to anybody else. Oh, so they have like burner phones, kind of. Is that what they go? No, they're. You can have iPhones, and it just connects to the Wi-Fi, so as long as they have Wi-Fi, they can play games and stuff like that. They just don't have the ability to call. They can call if somebody else has an iPhone and they're on Wi-Fi, but it comes from their um, their iCloud email address, not an actual phone number. And they only have me and their fathers and their, our family's numbers in there, so not ready for that yet. Sorry. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> because of this. Yeah, uh, Burkett uh, described uh, Sentry, said it's essentially a monitoring app that flags certain words and conversations. The word baby had been caught several times. At first they thought, oh, you must have a girlfriend. 
um, one of the that's what the family's lawyers said. The boy told his family that he was having a sexual relationship with his teacher. Yeah. They didn't believe it, and so his father said, "Show me." He got on Instagram and messaged her in a sexually explicit way, and she messaged him back. Um, <clears throat> oh, this, this is this is a classic. This is one of the things she said to this kid. If I could quit my job and fuck you all day, I would. She's disgusted. She wasn't she was she 26, 27? How old was she? 27 years old. Yep, I remember the story. She's and I remember in the news, like people, some of the guys being like, Oh, if that were me when I was a teenager, I would have been like hot getting a high five. No, I'm sorry. He's 13. Yeah. I, I dare a 27 year old woman to try to come after my 13 year old sons because let me tell you, it's not going to go well. No, we're no high five. That's not acceptable. It's child molestation. I don't care if it's a male. I don't care if it's female. I don't care who it is. It's gross, and you are ill. And well, no. Yeah, well, I, I went, when I was 12, I had a 19 year old showing me. Well, she did not. She didn't cross the line. She didn't touch me inappropriately or anything. But she was expressing interest, and in, I remember like I couldn't process it. It was like too. It was kind of overwhelming. Like you're, yeah, you're, you're not. That, you're not fair yet. You're very you're much at the start of going through puberty at that age. It's a level of of emotional complexity that you're just not developed enough to be able to to contend with, right? So yeah, and to say what she's saying so explicitly, I, I, mm, I don't have words. Well, later on, she, like, she was really caught up in this. Like she, another time, she said to the kid. OMG, oh my God, I love you. So this is... She's she gross. She was really into this guy. When you were like 12 or 13, did you have like grown men hitting on you, like 20s, 30s, 40s, and so on? Did you experience that? Um, There were certain things I can remember as an adolescent where I know I was not, definitely not of age, where I don't want to say friends, but maybe acquaintances around my, you know, at my parents' parties where m- men that were much older would say things to me that I did not feel appropriate and I felt uncomfortable, made me feel uncomfortable. So, yeah. Yeah, sure. every, everyone I've ever known, when I asked that question to it, they always said yes. Even yeah. if they were 12, they had like men in their 30s doing mm-hmm. it, older men. Yep. Uh, the 13, oh, well, sorry, go on. No, 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 you're good. Okay. A 13-year-old told the parties he and Zamora had at least four sexual encounters in 2018, including one in Zamora's car after a telling show and another in a school classroom while another student stood, stood guard outside. So his teacher also sent him nude photos. Wow. Like, I mean, she really, this was this was really premeditated. This was no an thing. Uh, and then the the boy uh, said, uh, yeah, it's like weird how a 27-year-old can like love a 13-year-old and do stuff. The boy's words, it's just crazy. She's not a good person. So no. obviously it uh, traumatized him. Poor kid. Zamora is one of dozens of teachers who in the digital age have pursued sexual relationships where there are students using popular messaging apps. Uh, Professor Virginia Commonwealth University said technology has always been a way that predators contacted sexual targets, groomed them, and arranged sexual activities. Did I mention before that uh, on children-only videos on YouTube that they don't allow comments because pedophiles were targeting children there? Yes, you did actually in the last episode, and I said I was happy because my my children spend a lot of time on YouTube, yeah. but I have the restriction set to children only um, videos, but I'm glad that that has been enacted. So at least you can feel a little bit safer about allowing them to be. That's just terrifying. It's all terrifying. Yeah. You know, well, per- perverts are always on the vanguard of technology. They always, right. Whatever. I've always, I even thought about not putting pictures of my children out on like Instagram or Facebook, you know, on Facebook, I only, I'm blocked. So only my friends can see me. But even then, you know, that sometimes I've second guessed because you just, there's so many people out there. They're 
perverts and you don't know where and when they are going to strike. Well, if you were to look in like a catalog for children's clothing, the swimsuit section doesn't actually have photos of children wearing swimsuits. Yeah. There's pictures of them at the outfit itself for obvious reasons. Correct. Um, yeah, so in tw- October 2019, they're describing another story. Massachusetts high school teacher Dorothy Bancroft, Dorothy Bancroft Vareka was busted for soliciting nude photos from a teen student on Snapchat. Yeah, so this thing, there's been plenty of examples of this going on. And uh, so... See, Snapchat I find shady, and I, I really am not on Snapchat a lot, because the, you can send the photo and then it deletes, so it doesn't yeah. save it. That, that I just find... Cr- very creepy when it comes to this type of a thing. Are people able to save the pictures? I've never they can, I think they can. I think you can screenshot it, but then it lets the person know. I was on my friends were Snapchatted like a couple years ago and started it. It's just I, something I never got into. I also never got really into Twitter. Sorry, but it's not something I really have time to do. I'd rather listen to podcasts. So, but it's just a creep factor especially when you're talking about this kind of thing. Well, her, Zamora's husband, uh, he was named in the lawsuit, but he didn't do anything really. Hmm. He settled with the family for a non-disclosed amount uh, while his wife went to prison. So that's how that ended. Did he divorce her? Uh, I sp- well, yeah. I, well, I don't know if he divorced. It doesn't say if they divorced or not, no. I would uh, hope. Uh, I mean... Uh, it's going to be hard to wait 20 years for your sex offender wife to get out of jail. I don't think I'd be waiting at all. No, no. All right, so uh, what's your first story? Uh, this is also the story I was going to do last week, but it was a longer one, so I saved it for this week. Okay. And it is from Australia, so if I mispronounce any of the um, towns, I apologize, so I'm going to do my best. <clears throat> the title of it is Which is a weird title, but you'll you'll understand why. We'll get there. Partner of man accused of murdering Jake Anderson Bretner recalls hearing noises and pleas. So Gemma Clark, 27, gave evidence on day six of the trial of her former partner, Jack Harrison Vincent Sadler, in the Supreme Court in Lancaster. Mr. Sadler, 29, has pleaded not guilty to murdering Jake Anderson Bretner at the Riverside home he shared with Miss Clark on August 15, 2018. So before I go further, this the, uh, crime happened back in 2018, but the trial was recent. Okay. Yeah. So um, Crown Prosecutor Daryl Coates, who is also Tasmania's Director of Public Prosecution, alleged in his opening statement last week that Mr. Sadler shot Mr. Anderson Bretner three times in a room he had lined with plastic and then cut up his body before disposing of body parts in wheelie bins. On Monday, Miss Clark told the court her partner had been, quote, angry with Mr. Anderson Bretner in the days leading up to the August 15th, 2018, but she did not know why. Quote, from the Sunday through to Wednesday, he, Mr. Sadler, wasn't himself, she told the court, it wasn't a nice atmosphere in the house. We weren't speaking much. Miss Clark and Mr. Sadler had always, I'm sorry, had asked, okay, this is, ready for this? Yeah. Mr. Clark said Mr. Sadler asked her to buy multiple items, including plastic, a saw, disposable gloves, and bleach on August 14th and 15th. Now, from recent, re- previous stories, what have we learned about that? It's not uh, effective as, as yeah. medicine. So first of all, if, if if my boyfriend's asking me to go buy those items, problem. And yeah. also, I'm not going to go buy them. Okay? Let's move on. Well, yeah, you can be charged <laughs> for buying certain items in combination. like. Oh, well, like, we'll find out. Like, like what they call burglary tools. So if there's a crowbar and a ski mask... Yes. Kind okay. of Plastic, yeah. assault, disposable gloves, and bleach. Yeah. yeah. Pretty sure those are some ringing bells. Hi, there's something wrong here. <clears throat> she did not know why her partner wanted all the products, but it was not unusual for the couple to buy bleach to clean their pet bird feeder. Okay, well, <laughs> that's, 
that's just bleach, ma'am. Not a saw. And yeah. No. A, gloves and plast, plastic. She said she did not. Okay, sorry. Uh, the car, court heard on the night of August 15th, Mr. Sadler asked Miss Clark to stay in her room with their pet dog and pretend she was not there. Miss Clark said around five to ten minutes later, another person arrived who was on the phone. She said the person then came into their house and soon moved into what they called the shoe room, a room usually filled with shoes, but which was then lined with plastic. Quote, I remember hearing noises, kind of like slamming of cupboard door kind of noise, she said. Quote, I heard someone say along the lines of, please, man, stop. Please, man, don't. The court was told Mr. Sadler went into the room where Miss Clark was, quote, a couple of minutes later. He was frantic, Miss Clark said. He said, there's two phones in the microwave, get them and smash them. The court was told that a short time later, Mr. Sadler asked Miss Clark to take garbage bags to the shoe room. Quote, he told me to hold them open, close my eyes and don't cry. So I did, it felt like forever. I opened them at one stage. I don't know what I saw, but I ran straight to the end suite and felt like I was going to be sick. I said, I can't do this. And Jack kept saying, you have to. She said she saw blood and something that looked, quote, dark and fleshy. The court had previously heard allegations that Mr. Anderson Bretner's body parts were put into garbage bags. Mr. Sadler's defense lawyer, Greg Richardson, Greg Richardson said during his opening statements last week, that there was no dispute that Mr. Sadler was involved in this disposal of the body, but he had the issue, but the issue was, did Jack Sadler kill Jake Anderson Bretner? So I guess there was no concrete evidence that he had committed the murder. He was definitely involved in disposing of the body because I don't, she didn't see it. You know, there was no witness. But is, so the evidence is anecdotal? Uh, circumstantial, or I believe that's called circumstantial. Yeah, yeah. It says it later. So it's based on testimony so far? Correct. Mm -hmm. Miss Clark said she did not hear anyone else in the house. She said she also took linen, sheets, and a mattress protector to the shoe room and then helped Mr. Sadler carry a, quote, heavy object to their car. Now at this point. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Ma'am. Okay. You don't have an excuse. You don't have an alibi. You are, you're in trouble. The court heard the couple then took that heavy object to the Tasman Highway to an area known as the Sidling near Scottsdale, where Mr. Sadler dumped the object down an embankment. Mr. Clark said when they got home, they loaded garbage bags into the car and then dumped them in wheelie bins. Quote, Jake asked me to Google where in Lancaston bins were being picked up the next morning, she said. She said the group drove to Gravelly Beach and West Lancaston. Quote, every so often he'd stop, we'd turn the lights off, he'd put a bag in a garbage bin, and then he'd get back in the car, she said. Mm -hmm. It had previously been alleged during the trial that the disposal of body parts in garbage bins was inspired by a rap song called Dead Body Disposal, which the accused liked to listen to. The song was, I don't, I want, I almost Googled it, but I didn't have a chance. So I don't know if I would like to. Try to look it up. And yeah. Up. So the song was played in the court during Miss Clark's evidence. Uh, she also gave evidence that Mr. Sadler had been using drugs in the days leading up to August 15th and that he owed a gun. Doesn't say what kind of drugs he was using. Okay. That song is by, uh, well, I, I, I pronounced it necro before, but it's actually pronounced necro. I mentioned that during the episode about uh, the murder of Tory Stafford. So, yeah, that's his song. Okay. Well, all there the, we go. His music is, is all about that sort of thing. So Very, very interesting. Okay. <laughs> in, in, don't post, maybe post a link on the Facebook page. I don't know if anybody wants to listen to it, but you can Google it if you'd like. In sentencing Sadler... Justice uh, Robert Pierce said the murder was a calculated, intentional, planned, cold-blooded killing. Sadler denied the murder charge throughout his 12-day trial and argued it was Victorian drug suppliers who had come into his house and killed Mr. Anderson Bretner, telling him to clean up the mess. He alleged, I was told to cut the body and get rid of it. 
Sadler claimed that that was exactly what he did. He told jurors Mr. Anderson Bretner's drug debt was then passed on to him. Sadler refused to name the three Victorian men, telling the prosecution, I'm not going to tell you, I'm not going to put my family in danger. The court heard Sadler had been getting illicit drugs from the Victorian supplisers for Mr. Anderson Bretner to sell throughout Lancaston. Mr. Anderson Bretner's torso was the only body part recovered, despite volunteers and police searching the Lancaston tip for almost two weeks. Sadler's 32-year sentence was backdated to August 18th, 2018, where he was taken into custody, when he was taken into custody. Clark, Miss Clark, is serving a five and a half year jail sentence for her role in the murder after she pleaded guilty to an accessory after the fact in failing to report the killing. She will be eligible for parole in August. Um, I also wanted to add that, so uh, the victim's mother, uh, so the victim had a mother, a sister with he had nephews and a fiance, obviously all devastated by this. But I, <clears throat> in her victim, in the mother's victim impact statement, Miss Anderson Bretner's mother, Claudette Bretner, Massey spoke directly to Sadler in court. Quote, she said, it would be easy not to for it would be easy to not forgive and be hard and bitter. But then I'd be more like you, Miss Bretner Massey said, I will show you the mercy that you did not show my son. Today, Jack, I choose to forgive you, not because you deserve it, but because I deserve peace. My son wasn't rubbish. He was precious and he was priceless, she said. So. Two things. Um, if there's something I've learned from this podcast, if you're going to commit murder, do it by yourself. Trust <laughs> nobody. Someone's going to spill the beans eventually. And then number, Correct. Number two, I think the most appropriate sponsor, if I had one for the show, would be glad garbage bags. <laughs> garbage bags factor into a lot of these stories. There's a lot of no kidding. garbage bags, and glad's like the king of garbage bags. Like, so, I want the one, like, we would get the ones that expand. I get the expandy ones, and they also smell good. They like, have, like, Febreze scent. I, yeah, I don't know if I've seen those or not. Come but, on, uh, Canadians don't have the Febreze scented tr glad trash bags? Well, Come I would do so if I was going to transport a body inside one i would use the febreze bag sure. right that just makes sense again we have very sick personalities and humor folks we do not mean this obviously it's very funny in our minds <laughs> exactly um yeah okay so um my next story is here's the headline because I, so i look I, I sought out stories in germany because oh in florida there's a lot of strange stories that come out of germany mm -hmm. uh, so this one, the headline is, Petty Thief Fled Supermarket Forgot His Son. So mm. this, this was in Berlin. Police in Germany say they had an easy time tracking down a petty thief after he forgot his own son at the scene of the crime. Uh, Bautzen police say, said Saturday that the 29-year-old suspect ran off when the five euros worth of goods, which is about $5.65 American, he was trying to steal trigger an alarm at a supermarket checkout late Friday. Police said the man's eight-year-old son was left behind, and so the culprit was quickly identified. The suspect, a German, also managed to fall over during his escape, ending the day in hospital. God. So, uh, yeah, try not to commit crime with your child beside you. Please, and also, and, but... It, it, Five dollars and, and change worth of stuff. I'm wondering, was he just trying to get something to eat? Like, what was? That's yeah, not a lot, you know. Maybe I don't know. Yeah, maybe he was poor and he was trying to feed. Yeah. His but I think it's I think it's a good thing that the child uh, knew better than to lie. Right? He didn't lie. Yeah. He knew right from wrong. He told the police his father did something wrong. So. The yeah, good for him. Aww. The child's morals, right? <laughs> He has morals. See, you're born. You kind of, you have them. Unlike his father, he's, he knows the right from wrong. <laughs> exactly. Oh, God. All right. So this one popped up. I Because I searched so many true crime news cases, I, it's very good for me now because they pop up in my news feed all the time, which makes things a little easier for me to research. But holy shit, is this one insane. And it is a Florida story. I think it's my only one, but I had to do it. It just happened. Um, 
and it's interesting the the police in this case I, I have to give kudos to because I do believe that they did the best they could but here we go we're, we're, let's we'll discuss after so this was in Deltona Florida uh, I believe it happened I, I want to say it was just last week <clears throat> Pair flees juvenile home, engages in gun battle with Volusia County deputies. Ready? Mm -hmm. Let me crack my knuckles here. A 14-year-old girl and a 12-year-old boy fled from a Florida juvenile home and broke into a house where they found a small arsenal, a shotgun, an AK-47, and plenty of ammunition. When confronted by sheriff's deputies, the pair opened fire, sparking a gun battle. The gunfire ceased only after deputies wounded the girl, identified as Nicole Jackson, and I'll tell you why the names are told here in a second, who was in critical but stable condition Wednesday, a day after the violence unfolded near Deltona, about 30 miles northeast of Orlando, so it's like middle of the state. The boy identified as Travis O'Brien then surrendered. This is this story actually I saw through my local news uh, department or my my, my no, local news cast. Yeah. Um, Wink News does not normally name children this young. However, in this case, because of the seriousness of the seriousness of the allegations, they did. I don't even. I guess that's legal. I guess well, normally they don't because just to protect their innocence. But when I read the rest of the story, you'll realize why. Maybe it depends on the the crime too. Like I don't know if this is a felony or not, but well, uh, I, I remember the 14 year old that I've been talking and up, updating you about that is now being tried as an adult for first degree murder. This is equally, I mean, they, well, not equally. I don't want to say that because he stabbed that girl 119 times, but I mean, these are kids committing a very adult crimes. I mean, 14 and 12. That's craziness. Area American crimes, too. Jesus, I know. <laughs> so, <clears throat> thanks a lot, Morgan. If the American flag shouldn't be 50 white stars. It'd just be 50 guns. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I feel personally attacked. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I'm no, I'm kidding. Feel, I'm totally feel, kidding. Feel, no, not at all. Nothing actually, there, there are probably Americans who would agree with me, though. But anyway, go on. That's true. Uh, the pair fled, or, I'm sorry, the pair fired at deputies from the house multiple times over 45 minutes. A visibly angry Sheriff Mike Chitwood told a, uh, told a news conference Tuesday evening, quote, they were traversing the length of the house and opening fire on deputies from different angles. He said they were out on the pool deck. They shot from the bedroom window. They shot from the garage door. Deputies tried to calm the situation and eventually returned fire. The sheriff said it was unlike anything he had been he had seen in 35 years in policing. Quote, deputies did everything they could tonight to de-escalate, and they almost lost their lives to a 12-year-old and a 14-year-old. The sheriff said, if it wasn't for their training and their supervision, somebody would have ended up dead. O'Brien and Jackson each faced charges of armed burglary and attempted murder of law enforcement officers. The deputies involved were put on administrative leave pending a review, the Volusia County uh, Sheriff's Office said. Staff members at the juvenile home in Deltona reported the pair missing, telling authorities the boy is a diabetic and needed insulin every four hours. They said the girl hit, the, hit a staff member with a stick before running away, the sheriff's news release said. As deputies were searching around the area, I'm searching the area around 7.30 p.m., a passerby flagged them down and reported hearing glass breaking at a nearby house. Deputies saw the pair inside the home and contacted its owner, who said no one was supposed to be at that home. The owner also advised authorities that the guns and 200 rounds of ammunition were inside the home, which the juveniles ransacked. Deputies surrounded the home and began talking to the pair. At one point, Chitwood said the deputy went close enough to the home to toss a cell phone inside to try to talk to them. The girl eventually came out of the garage with a shotgun and pointed it at the deputies. They repeatedly asked her to drop the weapon. Chitwood said she walked back into the garage. Quote, she comes back a second time, and that's when deputies open fire, and she takes multiple rounds, Chitwood said. He said the 12-year-old boy had told investigators that they had planned to, quote, roll like it's GTA, referring to the video game series Grand Theft Auto. See, I've never 
but everything everyone says about violent video games, people think it's justified now because that happened, right? There we go. Well, we can have a whole podcast about that. Yeah. It'd probably be controversial, so let's let's keep it not controversial. You but he wanna... said this. This was a quote, guys. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the often violent video game series tracks characters as they rise through a criminal underworld. In body, uh, body camera video released Wednesday, a deputy can be seen yelling, quote, put the gun down now as shots are fired at him repeatedly while he takes cover behind a tree in the yard. A, com- a commander over the radio tells deputies not to challenge them, quote, let's not engage them, the commander said, quote, let's just hang out here. But mi- several minutes later, a barrage of shots echoed across the lawn. Quote, they're shooting at me, the deputy said in the video a little bit later. I'm sorry, a little bit later, deputies report that the 14-year-old girl is down. Then the 12-year-old boy, whose author- who authorities said had been armed with an AK-47, came outside with his hands raised. Chitwood said the girl had been in trouble various times over the past year. She was accused of stealing, ready for this? Stealing puppies and was put in a halfway home. She said she set fires to half a dozen vacant lots where the flames came close to homes earlier this year and was sent back to Volusia County. She also cited a history of problems at the juvenile home the pair had fled. The AP left a message seeking comment at the juvenile home, but there was no response was given at the time. So this just happened and they're gonna go to trial. Yeah, you know, this, uh... I think they should be tried as adults because, for one thing, these are really heavy-duty crimes that can result in people dying if, if, if things go wrong. Not that they didn't go wrong. From her also, past, yeah. Yeah, and all, yeah, also her, that's the thing. Her past, there's a record yep. of uh, this kind of, you know, this kind of behavior. Obviously, this is not a new thing with her, and she needs to be straightened out. So she definitely deserves to be in prison for a few Something. years. Something. Something definitely happened with, I, I mean, she's been in a home for a while. The start of her life of crime started seemingly very early. I, I don't. That, well, I hope that whatever she was doing with the puppies, it didn't involve abuse. Ugh, I don't want to know. Uh, I really don't. And also, I was just having fun with you you guys, you Americans. It's all, it's, it's just. It's that, all in jest. Yeah. Okay. You guys make fun. You guys make fun of the rest of the world. <laughs> you make fun of our cultures. But, so I think I can take a little good-hearted ribbing now and then. I'm giving you permission to rib. Okay, I'll take it. Nobody get mad. Let's just we're having. We need. We need to just have fun and enjoy our true crime podcast. There are many great Americans in my life. My girlfriend. I have American friends. My co-host here. Most Me. Of my- most, yeah, most, most of my audience is American, probably maybe even like 90% at least. Yep. So I have nothing, nothing against American. A lot of my favorite things have come from the United States. So there you go. N- nothing against Americans. It was just a joke. So my next story is uh, a headline. You know, if this, poss- this is another German one. Couldn't possibly get more German than this. Oh, German. German cops use sausage to catch a burglar almost a decade after the crime. So this, <laughs> this is a lesson. If you're going to commit a crime, be really careful about DNA. And you, so, no, you and your food. Your, yeah. I love that you have these food, these yeah. food related crimes. Yeah, and I, I saw this sausage. It's not the kind that you would like put in a bun, you know, at a barbecue. Uh-huh. This it, it had like the appearance and the consistency from what I could tell kind of like spam or bologna so it's okay. like it's like this sausage you'd buy there in a can or something uh, so, so like Vienna sausages um no it's that not like small or bigger it, it uh it, well, it was much bigger than that it was like I think it's um maybe it's a bit chewier too so Ooh. they have a lot of different gradations of, of sausage in Germany they're that's true. Big, that's Very an true. article over there. Um, so, yeah, burgling a house must be pretty tiring work, you'd have to imagine, and it's bound to build up your appetite. But even so, you're probably best avoiding any potential snacks that might be lying around the scene of a crime because police might use them to track you even years later when you think you've gotten away with a crime. 
take one criminal in Germany who has been found almost a decade after he robbed a house, all because he took a bite out of a sausage, took one bite and left the chunk of sausage there. Back in 2012, Police were called to investigate a break-in at a property in the town of Gevelsburg in the German state of North Rhine-Westphalia. The burglar had long since vanished, but they were able to seize a sausage that had a chunk bitten out of it, which was suspected to have been eaten and then discarded by the crook. A DNA sample was obtained of sausage, but there was no match in the database until recently almost a decade later, in fact, when a 30-year-old Albanian man was identified as being the person who had bitten into the sausage during the robbery. He had been arrested after involvement in a separate violent crime, and police had taken a DNA sample that was entered into the international database. As a result, police say they were confident about that the DNA match has allowed them to catch the man responsible for the theft dating back to March 2012. According to the police, the DNA strand had been obtained by the forensic team in North Rhine-Westphalia, who have now reopened the burglary case and want to have them extradited from France to Germany, where the investigation continues. DNA is pretty useful in solving crimes, even historic ones. Yeah. Just ask the former police chief who believes that now DNA stu- new DNA studies could help to solve the mystery of the spy in the bag. Um, back in August 2010, a decomposing body of M16 analyst Gareth Williams was found in a locked hold, all in the bath of his flat in Pimlico, London. Um, and this actually brings, I don't think, I don't know if I've ever brought this issue up with you, but what, what would you think if, um, so basically anyone who's ever had an, medical care, had mm-hmm. to give blood tests, urine tests, all kinds of tests. Uh, and I know a lot of Americans, in order to get health insurance from their job, have to submit to these kinds of tests. And um, what would you think if the government were to do a thing where basically they enable law enforcement agencies to gather all data that's ever been collected by medical professionals and enter it into a database so that people who have committed crimes like murders but don't have a record the dna they can find their dna and trace it to who the offender is is do you think that's too much of an infringement on privacy or do you think it's maybe a good idea well i I actually we i actually talked about this in one of our previous episodes because we're 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 close to that yeah yeah. With, with the with the case the paul holes case i talked about for with them doing the familial dna and catching um why do I always forget his damn name? One of the most infamous murderers in, ever, and he, they caught them from he, they caught him with familial DNA. It was like 30 years later. Sorry, I'll just late, say it later. Was um, it the, the Golden State Killer? By was chance? it the Golden State Killer? It might have been the Golden State Killer. I, uh, yeah, I know that he like he stopped killing. I mean, it was like 30, 20 or 30 years, and then they found yep. their DNA or something. Yeah. So anyway, but at that point. Yes. Da, 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 da. I'm reading right now. I'm very quickly Googling. But I believe it was a Golden State Killer. So you essentially cannot take somebody's blood or DNA. The, the cops cannot use it without it being given, you know, um, willingly. So I can go right now and submit my DNA to certain websites that use our DNA and they do put them into the FBI and um, other law enforcement agencies into their systems. And they are solving a lot of old murders because, yeah. you know, somebody's great, great granddaughter, you know, d- submitted DNA. I think that's phenomenal. Do I think we will ever come to a point in America where it is forced? No, I don't. Well, I mean, I I think... Do like, I think it's a good idea? I don't know. I think that's... Well, I think there should be like a proviso that they can't tell the government about your medical history, just your DNA. That's all. Just, you know, so yeah. It, I'd have it, to think on that one a little bit. I haven't thought about it that much. I mean, I, I don't have anything to, 
to hide. Per so I would, yeah. you know, if it, if it, uh, like I said, I think I said before, God forbid any of my past ancestors committed crimes and I was helped to solve. I mean, I helped my blood helps or DNA help solve them. I'd be happy for that. Like if you're a freaking criminal, you're a criminal, but I know, I know that law enforcement, they can, they can subpoena medical clinics and right. Like uh, BTK's daughter once had a pap smear test. I don't know how the police found out about it, but they actually, well, they just decided they go into their, his family members and to get like DNA confirmation. So, yeah. yeah. And so they managed to get a hold of the record of her pap smear. And so the DNA taken from that procedure uh, showed a match for her father's, of course, as you can imagine. And that was one way in which they managed to, you know, throw the book at him. So yep. they could they could solve a lot of cold cases for it. Um, another another thing would be good for if say a child was abducted and the, the kidnappers left DNA behind. Yes. And you find it like really yeah. quickly. Like imagine if if that had been around when Ariel Castro abducted those girls you know they could have got went and got them within the week you know i mean there's no doubt that it would be helpful to law enforcement but there is that just there's just that line of what does what does the government how much power do they have over your personal information or your personal you know anything so well, you know, it, it, here especially you know what america we're, we we like our our rights and I, that's just I don't know I don't know where I stand on that one. Ooh. Government is not always a bad thing. You know? No. There are many ways in which you benefit from. Of course, of course. Right? Like your sons yeah. are safe for the most part because of the government because they there's because of police and other law enforcement agencies and uh, got people who work in the community who kind of look out for them to an extent and uh, laws that govern education so that when they go to school they're protected so yep absolutely and go ahead no go ahead no i was gonna say going back I, it, so it was the golden state killer and i think maybe on the next the next uh true crime news i might go over this because i i'm gonna i reference that a lot because it, it fascinates me and i think it's amazing and it was a huge step and break in DNA testing. So I might find a little art, like a, a shortened article on how they came about this and what exactly it is, just so any listeners who are not familiar with it know what I'm talking about. So. Well, I mean, if anybody, worries, if anybody would worry about their privacy in terms of having their DNA right. submitted to the FBI and whatnot, well, yeah. don't kill anybody. Don't kidnap. <laughs> how about that? <laughs> don't molest any children. You'll be. You'll be Copacetic, you know. So uh, it's just my, not easy. My next story is uh, burglar gets six years after breaking into home and downloading pornography. So I don't know who these burglars are who keep stopping and eating stuff and downloading porn. I'm pretty sure he's supposed to just get in and get out, not stealing guns, uh, grab the jewelry and money if there's some, and leave. But anyway. A 22-year-old burglar has pleaded guilty and been sentenced to more than six years in prison after he broke into the house of three female students and used a laptop to download pornography and commit a sex act. He also helped himself to refreshments. Okay, so he had some food, oh, too. Jesus, here we go. While he was there, but that's obviously much less serious than the stuff he did with the laptop. Jonathan Jose Ruiz broke into the house in the city of Orange in California before downloading the lewd material onto one of the three college students' laptops and leaving semen on it. So, so much for that laptop. Dude, you're an idiot. Okay, now we have food and semen. Great. Yeah, you're that brilliant. Laptop, that laptop is uh, going to Facebook marketplace. Right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, he accepted a plea deal offered by Orange County Superior Court Judge Gary Polson, who then sentenced him to six years and eight months imprisonment. Orange County's Deputy District Attorney Evelyn Vasquez objected to the judge's offer of a plea deal. According to the court records, Ruiz has been given credit for 511 days of a sentence and pleaded guilty to felony counts of burglary and vandalism. He was actually arrested on the evening of 4th of October 2018 when police said he broke into the home, 
sifted through the underwear belonging to the residents, and left semen on the computer that he then used to download pornography. So it's, yeah. that, that's a weird sequence of events. So first he put the semen on the laptop, and then he downloaded the pornography. What an Usually idiot. the other way around. That's maybe maybe it was the underwear that got him off. It's a fetish. Yeah. Who knows? Yep. Sergeant Phil McMullen of Orange Police Department said that Ruiz also helped himself to milk and cookies from inside the hole. What in the foot are you, oh, fucking oh, Santa? That, how wholesome. <laughs> you, think so, like, you want milk and cookies after? Really, dude? You, Jesus Christ. I can't. You'd think he would help himself like, to the liquor stash or something, right? Yeah, uh, a sausage Sar- and, a, and, a, and a glass of scotch. <laughs> or had a beer <laughs> or something, you know? Uh, Sergeant McMullen added that the police had been able to track Ruiz down quicker than they would normally have been able to after they used a new method to identify him. Obviously, having the evidence that they discovered on the laptop was useful to them as well. Upon his arrest, it was reported that Ruiz was also in possession of two pairs of underwear belonging to the college students living in that house, Mm -hmm. as well as a number of other items from the home. The reason they were able to track him down using DNA was because it was already on file since Ruiz was convicted of vandalizing the toilets at El Modena High School in Orange back in 2017, according to court records. On 23rd of October 2017, he pleaded guilty to counts of misdemeanor vandalism and possession of graffiti devices. For that, okay, so he was vandalizing toilets by spray painting them. Yeah, so this guy is committed to decorating the world. Okay. It's just too bad, he, too bad he didn't stick to, to spray paint <laughs> his own materials, uh, if, if you know what I'm saying. It's a, it might be an art buff. Yeah. I mean, cookies <laughs> no. Cookies and fucking milk. <laughs> yeah, you'd think you would have, well, I, mean, I don't know, maybe, maybe that was the mo- all they had there, really. But. I mean, they are, they are college kids, so they probably weren't of age to drink, perhaps, and these girls have, like, you know, ice cream, cookies, milk, that's what they, you know. Yeah. That's their okay. thing in there. So across the whole United States, is 21 the age that you can start legally drinking, or is there... Is no, it's just tw- 21. 21, that's it, because here in Canada, it's uh, 19, so I keep... Yeah, I keep forgetting it, that. Yeah, it's 21. And the interesting thing is um, recently they raised the age of buying tobacco products to 21, mm. which I found interesting because you can serve your country at 18. Yeah, but you can't smoke. Sign up to die, but you can't smoke cigarettes. <laughs> can't okay. smoke a fag, as they call them in Jesus England. Christ. Yeah, so uh, whatever. All right, what's your next story? Oh, got a decent story here. Out of Oki, Oklahoma. Uh, Suspected cannibals. This is a good one. Allegedly performed botched castration, froze body parts for consumption. Are you intrigued? Because I was. Of course. Bobby Lee Allen, who allegedly operate... You guys, this is... I can't even deal. Okay. (laughs) Bobby Lee Allen, who allegedly operated an underground sex change clinic out of an Oklahoma cabin, told one victim, yes, underground. It's like so, like, you know, not Mm. legal. Like a back alley abortion? Yeah. Back alley sex change place. Right. Right. The victim, by the way, is just, I don't even know. He's in a whole other realm of stupidity. But, okay. Um, Out of an Oklahoma told one victim he ate the extracted reproductive organs, according to authorities. Two alleged cannibals are accused of running a makeshift clinic in Oklahoma where they performed illicit illicit sex change procedures. Bob Lee Allen, 53, and Thomas Evans Gates, 42, were arrested last week after a botched surgery on an unidentified man who allegedly commissioned the pair to carry out his own castration, the Oklahoman reported. The man who traveled from Virginia to the pair's cabin in Oklahoma wound up hospitalized following the amateur procedure on October 12th. This was the last year, or I believe, or 2019. He later told detectives he found <laughs> Allen online after searching the web for castrations. Allen, the victim, alleged, said he had 15 years of surgical experience and promised to perform the operation for 
free of charge. Mm. In which I pause. Because if somebody's going to offer to perform an operation for me, especially such as castration free of charge, I'm going to go ahead and say no. I'm thinking of Jeffrey Dahmer in the afterlife thinking to himself, why didn't I think of that? Right? Because he ate some penises. Yes. And yeah. Good point. <laughs> so this guy willingly said, okay, that sounds like a fucking great idea. Okay, quote, Allen told him that the surgery wouldn't cost him anything, an arrest affidavit obtained by the Oklahoman said, but there was one hook. Allen was willing to perform the operation because he, quote, videos the procedures for personal use, the victim told investigators. The victim told law enforcement that after arriving at the cabin, Allen, assisted by Gates, initially, I'm sorry, initiated the roughly two hour surgery, quote, unquote. The procedure began with injections in the needed areas, he said, according to the arrest affidavit. Following the operation, Allen allegedly told the man he intended to eat the man's reproductive organs and showed him pictures on his phone of body parts belonging to former clients in his freezer. Quote, Allen stated that after the surgery was over, that Allen said that he was going to consume the parts and laughed and said that he was a cannibal, the affidavit stated. Allen, who claimed he had half a dozen more clients scheduled, then regaled and stunned the patient with ghastly accounts of their genital mutilations he had carried out, the victim told authorities. The 53-year-old allegedly complained about one crazy client who he left opened up to die overnight, authorities said. The following day, Allen allegedly told the man who suffered heavy bleeding in the procedure's aftermath that if he died or passed out, they dump his body in the woods. Quote, no morgue, no we are, Ellen allegedly said. Allen eventually took the man to the hospital, the man that he, uh, this man, this the current suspect, or I'm sorry, uh, victim. Allen eventually took the man to the hospital, although he warned him to tell hospital staff he'd done it to himself. The maimed victim, meanwhile, quickly told medical examiners the two men tried to get him to participate in cannibalism. Allen and Gates were booked on October 15th after trying to visit the victim in the hospital. Fucking idiots. <laughs> County authorities say they later discovered what appeared to be frozen testicles in a freezer of the cabin where the illegal procedure allegedly occurred. Appeared to be. Is, there's, were, they, were, they mistook it for something else? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good point. They appeared to be frozen testicles. Sir, I think we know. I mean, yeah, no. Like, they like, could have been. No, testicles. I would know testicles. Thank you. But people don't even eat that from from animals. Well, okay. Bologna, no, Rocky uh, Mountain Rocky. oysters. Yeah, that's true. And bologna people and hot eat dogs testicles dogs. all the time. Yeah, you got me there. Yeah. Yeah. Was it was it uh, that movie? Not Funny Farm, but um. Was that the one with Chevy Chase where he, he ate all these things and then they finally told him that after eating like three plates of it, he'd been eating sheep testicles? Sounds familiar. Yeah, I think that was, yeah, that was good. I think I, I don't think, have I, I haven't tasted testicles. Not saying that I, I mean, I, if they were prepared pro appropriately, maybe I would. I don't know. I mean, why not? Uh, God, no I'm so weird. Well, they don't would you try? To. Would you eat testicles? Well, not not testicles that have been detached, removed. Not human blood. testicles. Oh no, no, I wouldn't. You know, prairie oysters. No, I don't think I could do it. Oh yeah, we call them Rocky Mountain oysters. Well, those are, uh, I believe, beef testicles. I think the prairie oysters are sheep testicles. Yeah. Perhaps. Yeah. Well, we've talked. We, now we've talked about testicles way too long. Let me continue. Jesus, we've we're losing listeners by the minute. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> quote everyone every man is holding their their crotch right now sorry guys yeah uh quote i can't say it's cult activity lafleur county sheriff rodney Derryberry, yes his last name is Derryberry. sorry i chuckled at that told the oklahoman it is something that we have never in my career run across in this part of the country it is borderline some type of activity that's all he said we know that there's a lot of rumors out there but at this time there's no danger to the public Lee and Gates have been charged with medical battery maiming, medical battery maiming, desecration of a human member, 
aggravated assault and battery with a dangerous weapon resulting in gross bodily injury, conspiracy, possession of a controlled substance or paraphernalia, and outraging public decency with gross injury. And they did not have a medical background at all, right? Uh, not they. It, he claimed he did, but it does not say anywhere in here that he actually had a uh, medical um, background. So, uh, well, it's yeah. like I, what I read online this week, and I don't think it qualifies as a meme exactly. But you know, politicians who are trying to criminalize things like sex change operations, abortion, they're not going to get rid of it. Correct. Make safe procedures safe procedures illegal and so people will resort to going to people like them or the back alley abortions you know with coat hangers or whatever and absolutely people get life-threatening infections so it's just like trying to stop prostitution you know you're, you're not getting you're not getting rid of it you're just making it so that women who do work in that trade are are unsafe uh, you're gonna make it more dangerous correct yeah, yep. exactly vulnerable to being murdered assaulted you know whatever Yep. Okay, so have you thought that was the last food-related crime story? Oh, I love it, Morgan. Oh, you got you got another thing coming. Uh, so this one. Are you hungry when you start searching for mm -hmm. stories? I actually had my dinner already. I don't, I don't know if I was hungry, but uh, this one. <laughs> actually, this is kind of like a, a story where it deals with specific individuals, but it's also kind of an issue story. So um, death row inmates in Texas no longer get a last meal because of one man. This guy fucked it up for everyone. I know this story. So, so no death row <laughs> prisoners in the U.S. state of Texas receive a bespoke last meal before they are executed anymore because one inmate ordered an absolutely mammoth last meal and refused to eat a bite of it because he said he wasn't hungry. The, the idea of the last meal is one of the most intriguing and macabre parts about the whole U.S. justice system. Imagine having to sit down and choose a menu that would be suitable for your last ever food on this earth. Where would you even start? Well, you can forget about most of it to begin with. It's well documented that they often can't or won't get in the food that most people demand, meaning they have to get a substitute or just go without. That means no fillet steak, no bluefin tuna, and no foie gras. In Texas... You don't get anything at all, just the grub that the other prisoners are being served that day, which apparently has no flavor because uh, they don't include salt for the few guys who have heart conditions. Mm -hmm. The inmates facing death have only Lawrence Russell Brewer to thank for that. Brewer was a white supremacist murderer who was jailed alongside three other men for killing James Bird Jr. by dragging him along behind a pickup truck mm -hmm. for three miles along a road. Can you imagine? I remember this story. I know I know it. I've heard it. And I I know this guy and where this is going. And it was think, a really shitty story. I think that was a really famous case, yeah. Um, One Brewer, of my pods did it. And it was, yeah. And, and then they talked about this last meal. But it's going to be, <laughs> just wait. Brewer and accomplice John King were the first white men to receive the death penalty for killing a black man in modern Texas. And their atrocities prompted the state to introduce, introduce uh, new laws surrounding hate crimes. Another accomplice, Sean Barry, was sentenced to life imprisonment for the crime. Before Brewer's execution, he was asked what he would like to eat as his last meal. And his request was an absolutely enormous amount of food. According to a report from the time published in the Houston Chronicle, Brewer asked for a... Here we go. Yes, this is amazing. Hang on. A Everybody get ready for it. A bowl of fried okra with ketchup. Have you had that before? I ha Yes. I don't I, I don't like okra. I, I I used to eat fried okra, and then I, I don't. I, I <laughs> felt I don't like it anymore. You were so over that fried okra, huh? It's just, it's uh, okra, ugh, it's very slimy. Oh, yeah. So this is a vegetable, is it? It's a, yeah, it's a vegetable. Yeah, we, we don't have it up here. Uh, two chicken steaks with gravy and onions, a cheese omelet with ground beef, jalapenos, and bell peppers. Uh, there's more. On top of that, he wanted a triple meat bacon cheeseburger, three fajitas, one pound of barbecue, 
and a half loaf of white bread, pizza meat lover special, one pint of homemade vanilla bluebell ice cream, one slab of peanut butter Fred fudge with crushed peanuts, and three root beers. See, I think they were t- he was just fucking with them, right? Oh, no, 100%. Yeah, he just wanted them to, to, to really put themselves out to get all this shit. Because they have to go, they literally have to go get all this shit. Like somebody, well, it's somebody's job to go and, and get all this stuff from restaurants. They don't, you know, they can't just, they don't order it from the kitchen. Oh, yeah. Specific brand names and everything. Have, well, I don't know if it's that, but they have to, you know, they have to go, it, that kind of food is not available in a prison. So, so it is literally somebody's job to go get the, the uh, prisoner's last meal. So you're it sending somebody on a fucking goose chase going around all these places getting all these items, which is ridiculous. And when you consider where prisons are often located, like out in isolated right. areas too. Yep. So, um, yeah, then when the meal or an approximation of it, however much they could get, was placed before him, he refused to eat any of it. That prompted Texas Senator John Whitmire to end the 87-year-old tradition of offering a last meal choice to condemned inmates. Effective immediately, everyone on death row would eat when what everyone else ate. As for Brewer, he proved himself a horrible man to the last. On the day before his execution, even after James Byrd's family had asked for his life to be spared, mm-hmm. he told KHOU 11 News, as far as any regrets, no, I have no regrets. No, I'd do it all over again to tell you the truth. Wow, what a douche. I totally remember this case. If you guys have not heard this case, go look it up. There's a couple pods that have done it, and it is something else. This man is just a fucking asshole. And thanks a lot, because first of all, Texas is a very is very hard on criminals. I think, I don't want to misquote, but they probably, of any other state, used to, I don't know if it's so fact now, have more... Um, death row inmates than probably any other state because they're hard. They don't, they're Texas, dude. They're Texas. So this asshole just messed it up for everybody else who may have wanted a last meal by being to the end, a complete douche canoe. Yeah. Yeah. We don't have the death penalty here, but I have given thought to what I would have if that last meal proviso was a factor in the equation. And I've had a lot of thoughts. So I think I probably have lobster Ooh. and uh, something sweet for dessert. That'd be a tough choice, either cake or like key lime pie or something like that. God, we have the best key lime pie in Florida. Oh, is that you make it? Well, we, I don't make it, but I mean, we're close to the oh, yeah, key, so we have key limes. That's where that's where it's from, right? Yeah, so, key limes, yeah. Yeah, it would, it would like. It, yeah, I didn't think to get any when I was there that one time. I should do that when I go there again someday. I can get you some, bud. Oh, I, I'll, I'll be happy, happy to eat it. Uh, so what's uh, your um, next story? My next story. What the heck? Hang on. Oh. Okay. Okay. Here we go. You messed me up. Oh, did I? I think you messed me up. Did I throw it out of order numerically, or? I I think you. I don't know what you did. Wait, we only have one more story left. We're good, right? I have a few more, but if you just have one, that's fine. I can. I think I met. I think I missed one. All right, whatever. Hang on. We're just gonna do this one. All right. So, this is one of. You're gonna. This is hilarious. It's a freaking food story, dude. (laughs) What the fuck is happening today? We must have had food on our heads. All right, so a man allegedly, this happened um, during the beginning of the pandemic, and it's just great. Man allegedly breaks into coronavirus shuttered restaurant, spends days eating food and drinking booze. Luis Ortiz is accused of consuming thousands of dollars worth of food and drink in a New Haven, Connecticut eatery that's been closed, that was closed because of the COVID-19 pandemic. A Connecticut man allegedly took advantage of a coronavirus-related restaurant closure, breaking into an eatery and turning it into his personal multi-day smorgasbord. New Haven police say Luis Ortiz, 42, spent four hours gorging himself 
on food and drink stored inside the closed Sol de la Cuba Cafe, according to a local newspaper, the New, the New Haven Register. The restaurant is closed to, due to ongoing COVID-19 pandemic that had hit Connecticut and the rest of the country. Ortiz was found asleep in the restaurant by respi responding officers Tuesday morning after authorities received a call about a burglary in progress. Investigators reviewed security footage, which confirmed the initial burglary occurred several days prior on Saturday when Ortiz made entry through a side window of the restaurant, Duff told the outlet. Officers learned Ortiz helped himself over the course of four days to the restaurant's food, liquor, and beer. In addition to eating and drinking at the restaurant, Ortiz removed beverages from the property and the building. Uh, all told, you ready? Okay, four days, four days. All told, Ortiz allegedly consumed 70 bottles of liquor and thousands of dollars worth of food and beverages inside the restaurant at the time of his arrest. Seven. Authorities, 70 bottles of liquor. Wait, days. you said he was there for a few days, right? Four, four well, days, well, I guess four it, days. Well, I suppose like you could do that. Like if you could, uh, you, you might get alcohol poisoning, but I suppose you could drink all of that. that That's a not, lot. Of alcohol, yeah. like I'm wondering if that included beer. Uh, I mean, that's yeah. 17.5 bottles a day. I think so. the Cubans are fond of rum, aren't they? It, all, oh. Who knows? Yeah, I don't know. Everything. Um, Ortiz was held in lieu of a $12,500 bail at the police, the police department's detention center when then arraigned on Wednesday. Duff said. He has been charged with burglary and larceny, both in the third degree, first degree criminal mischief and sec second degree failure, failure to appear. Lieutenant Sean Maher, district manager for the downtown New Haven, told the register that alleged break in is not part of a large, larger trend and that the rate of burglaries in New Haven has not increased during the pandemic. The local police department has added additional overnight patrols in the area to dissuade potential burglaries. Maher told the uh, outlet he was also suggested that he also suggested that businesses business owners without alarms to check in on to check in on their establishments oh my god Rachel fucking read to check in on their establishments every few days so I kind of don't hate this crime <laughs> mm -hmm. the food might have probably gone to waste anyway because they weren't going to open for a while so the alcohol maybe but the food eh No, I'm not too angry about it. Yeah. Okay. You could you, you could have done worse. Yeah, well, I mean, I don't know. So he didn't go for the safe? He didn't try to find a safe and get money or anything? No, nope, he just... They, yeah, they closed down so long ago, I guess there wouldn't have been money, right? So. Yeah, and I did find my other story, so I got one more after that. That was supposed oh. to be my last one to be nice and light, so I'm going to now leave. And now I'm going to end on a shitty one because... Whatever. It's fine. <laughs> yeah, okay. My next one. Uh, this is, uh, we talked in the last episode about children sometimes making their parents angry. Mm-hmm. And you can be th thank, thank your lucky stars not, neither of your sons have done this. Oh, uh, this is another German story. German teen sells mom's jewels for brothel visit. Sold her damn jewelry. So, oh, man, I mean, Christ. you said it. Do you have jewelry that's like of not only monetary value but sentimental value as well? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So ima imagine, so a 14-year-old German teenager took his mother's jewelry worth between 2,000 and 3,000 euros, which is 2,500 to 3,800 American dollars, Damn. and pawned, pawned it for 300 euros, which is about 380 dollars, to finance two trips to a brothel. For himself and a friend, German police said on Wednesday, uh, Carl's Rural Police spokesman Rolf Minet said the teenager's mother is pressing charges of theft against her son, good for her, mm -hmm. who admitted he pawned the jewelry to pay for the prostitutes. We don't know what the mother's motives are for pressing charges. It's possible she wants to teach him a lesson, or it's possible that she felt she had lost control. Police are also investigating the brothel that the boys said they visited. Prostitution in Germany is, excuse me, it's legal, but the clients must be aged 18 or over. 
The operator of the brothel told police that they had sent the boys away because they were underage. Hmm. You know, the, um, there's this great video on YouTube. This judge uh, set up a program which is pretty close to Scared Straight or Beyond Scared Straight. Right. They bring the kids into a real prison, and uh, they have the inmates, like, screaming at them and shit. What, what, what do you think? Do you think that's... Do you think that's going too far, or do you think the kids need to be scared? If they're no, I don't think it's going too far. No. I really don't. Mm-mm. If they're starting to run afoul of the law, I mean, they need to know, like, you know, what it's like in real prison. You know, yep. a, lot of them, a lot of these kids are young and cocky, and they think they're invincible. Yep. But yep. Uh, especially if you're 18 and you're going to prison, you're fresh meat. Yep. It's gonna be you're real, set, you're real gonna, tough. It's one. gonna be real tough. I, like I said, I, I I know people personally who've been in, and it's not it's not fun and games. It's 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 really not. So oh. if you're a juvenile and you think that you're gonna be a hard ass and you're gonna go into prison and it's all gonna be you're gonna be that hard ass in there, you're not. Oh, no. Especially I mean, when you're committing hard crimes and you're with hard criminals. I mean, obviously there's in the United States there's different levels of prisons you know there's the the not the hard max that were murderers and, and super max yeah. super max thank you yeah and then you know there's the white collar prison so they're different but still none of them are none of them are fun and you're not gonna as an 18 year old child you're you're not gonna fare well man it's gonna ruin know. you for life well, I mean, and, and it's not any easier in women's prisons. In no, it's fact, not. There's more sexual assault in the women's prisons than there is in the men's prisons. So that's something to take into account as well. So. Yep. Uh, All right, what's your next, your last story? What's My last, last story? story is, the title is Father Charged with Murder of Five-Week-Old Son Allegedly Asked Detective to Shoot Him After Leading Investigators to the Boys' Corpse. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, Chile. So this one happened a couple weeks ago, so it's fairly new as well. <laughs> Chilling new details have been released in the disappearance and murder of a five-week-old baby in Alabama last month. Caleb Winsnand Sr., 32, stands accused, accused of killing his infant son, Caleb C.J. Winsnand Jr., after crying in front of a local news camera and hoping for the death of for hoping for the dead child's safe return. So this, he, the child was missing. He went in front of cameras and pled for the child's safe return. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, according to the AL.com, this is a site run by a collective of newspapers across the state of Alabama. Um, Montgomery County Sheriff's Office testified that Wisnand eventually admitted to killing CJ, but insisted that he didn't intend to do so. Quote, he said it was an accident. He had hit his head. Montgomery County Sheriff's Office investigator John Shepard said during the initial hearing before the 15th Circuit District Judge Tiffany McCord. What's more, the investigator said the elder Wisnan was allegedly so ashamed that he craved his own death. During his testimony, Shepard reportedly said the defendant, quote, looked at me and asked me to shoot him. After that request, the de- uh, detective said Wisnan was handcuffed for safety reasons. Those alleged admissions of guilt came after the boy's father is said to have, lead invest, to have led investigators to the shallow grave where CJ was buried in nearby Lowndes County. Angela Gardner, the boy's mother, was also at the makeshift burial site and after the body was recovered. Wisnan allegedly ran up to her, hugged her, and said, I'm sorry. Quote, he led the investigators straight to the shallow grave, Shepard said. The boy died of, quote, acute injury that killed him within minutes, according to the testimony of forensic pathologist Dr. David Radzewski of the Alabama Department of Forensic Sciences. Wisnan originally and publicly claimed that he last saw his son at a Circle K gas station in Montgomery. Quote, I don't remember a lot, but I did remember that I was breaking up, you know, with the cops. I don't even know what that means, but it's a quote. Wisnan said during the news conference with the crestfallen gardener at his side, Quote, if anybody's got anything, any places that I could have gone, you know who you are. It would mean everything to us. The family ain't the same without family. That's for sure. The child's mother also uh, endorsed that story, presumably 
presumably because she believed him when he told her that version. Quote, he went to pay for gas at the gas station and realized he was gone, Gardner said, referring to Wisnan. He let the police know and me know then he, that he was missing. Shepard testified during the hour-long hearing that surveillance video was unable to confirm the story about the gas station. Quote, we viewed uh, video footage at Circle K, the detective told Judge McCord. We did not see anybody like the child from that location. Rather, investigators said, the last time CJ was seen alive on video was at a Walmart in Montgomery County during the mid-afternoon of Monday, May 11th, the day he was reported missing. According to Shepard, Wisnan gave several substantially different versions of what happened to the baby boy the weekend prior. Investigators later confronted the defendant on one very large-sized hole in the ever-changing nature of his stories. The cell phone data allegedly showed him traveling to Lowndes County, which is where the boy was found. When he was confronted with his uh, resistance in mentioning that alleged trek, Wisnan claimed he went on a, quote, drug run, drug run according to Shepard. Another video, this time pulled from a bank camera, appeared to show Wisnan throwing away a child's sock in a pacifier. I felt something was amiss, Shepard told the court. Two days after his initial police interview, Wisnan and Gardner gave the non, the now famous, the now infamous, sorry, press conference. The next day, CJ's father was charged with murder. Judge McCord ultimately ruled that enough probable cause was granted for a grand jury to consider a murder indictment. She also considered a gag order, which was opposed by the prosecution at the request of Wisnan's defense team. Mm. New case. You know, uh, I, I though I imagine that people who work in, in places like mortuaries and the morgue are very jaded in terms of seeing dead bodies. I don't know. I'm wondering. It must, it must still be disturbing to see a baby, especially if it's been murdered, assaulted. I wouldn't be able to do that. That, that, must, that, must, be, that must still kind of rattle them a bit, you know? I would think if it didn't, then... I mean, you're completely detached from human emotion because that's just a five-week-old baby. It's just... That, like, even though they do look at them mostly from a scientific point of view of course i understand that yeah still but it has to get to you well i mean to see like a baby with bruises and cuts and mm. stab wounds bullet no. wounds, that, that that must still be hard i mean i have a i have this book called death scenes it's a book of real crime scene photos and there's a few pictures of babies in there and it's it's pretty mm. fun yeah of One course of, morgan would have that book yeah well, one of them, uh, a, a, a woman had a baby, and uh, she must have been like schizophrenic or something, because the baby, the baby, she, apparently the baby looked a lot like its father, and she hated the father, so she, she took a knife and cut the baby's head off. Oh my God. Yeah, it's it's fucked up. Why do you do these things to me right before the end of the podcast? <laughs> uh, I have to sleep. Well, fortunately, my last story has the topic. <laughs> Has some comic relief to it. Okay, good. So, uh, uh, yeah, this is it's also a per public service announcement of sorts. It concerns the abuse of 911 people calling it for silly reasons. Uh, it's only for emergencies. I actually, I don't think I told you this, did I? I studied uh, to be an emergency telecommunications operator. No, you didn't. Which, yeah. So I trained to take calls for police, fire, and ambulance. I never got hired to do it. But I have this the college certificate. I have and a he, friend who does that actually. He recently got it. He used to work with me, and then he he finally had after years of trying got in. And he's a 911 dispatcher now. Well, I mean, um, I live in a big city, and I, because I don't know all the streets and the landmarks and where they are, what quadrants they're located in, you I can, can never, learn them. I try to, but it's a big city. It's uh, much bigger than Fort Myers, believe me. Oh, I'm sure. Well, it's about four million people here now, I think. So. Jesus. Uh, so yeah, so this is this is a Canadian story. Uh, it takes place. It took place um, in the Chatham Kent district of the province of Ontario, which is a uh, two or three hours south of Toronto. Probably about an hour to an hour and a half drive from Niagara Falls. 
to give you an idea of where this is. Mm-hmm. Um, so a police force in southwestern Ontario has released a list of the silliest 911 calls it received in 2016, including one where a resident called the emergency line asking for the phone number to the local KFC. That's one. The Chatham-Kent Police Service says it tries to educate citizens about the importance of calling police when they see crimes or suspicious activities, but on occasion they say police get calls that don't quite fit into those categories. In one call, a woman dialed 911 saying all her cable TV programs were in French, but she was not French. (laughs) In Canada, we have a lot of French programming. In another, police had to go to a residence to settle a heated dispute between two neighbors for the ownership of a jar of peanut butter. Oh, dear so God. You've done some fucked up roommate stories, and that one in its own way is pretty disturbing. If a jar of peanut butter, uh, if they feel that warrants a call to the police. No kidding. The force says they've also had a call asking who delivers a local paper in specific neighborhoods and a social media inquiry about whether police could help with the temperature in a resident's apartment. Obviously not. (laughs) You know, that almost warns... You know what? Listen, I'm not going to (laughs) lie. Sometimes in Florida, like let's say, okay, we're going into summer. So... You can probably hear the frog outside my freaking door right now. By the way, I despise frogs. I am terrified of them. I hate them. I wish they all burn on fire. And sorry if you like frogs, but I don't care. Um, But we're getting into the rainy season. So it rains every single day, every afternoon. And it is 94 degrees with 100% humidity. So you walk outside and it feels like an oven. And also now we're in hurricane season. So if you have that. Then the power goes out for a couple of days. I'm, well, you can't call 911 because God help you, we have no power. Yeah. But I mean, it's kind of an emergency at some point. Yeah. Well, I mean, get a generator. Yeah, exactly right. And uh, I was going to say, but yeah, the, the, I mean, these silly calls that almost warrants police brutality right there, right? Yeah. That I mean, it's absolutely an abuse of the system for sure. Well you, well, you know who abuses the, uh, the police number or 911? Karens and elderly women. They yeah. probably call police more than anybody and over a lot of stupid shit. Uh, police also had a call from a woman asking if it was legal to trap squirrels in her backyard and take them to a farm's field. You don't call the police about that. You call your municipal government. Oh my God. Uh, there was also an, in, an instance where friends became concerned when a woman in Chatham posted, he's trying to kill me on her Facebook page and called police after being unable to reach her. The woman ended up explaining to officers that she had posted the message online after her husband had passed gas. Oh my yeah. Yeah. Oh Chatham my God. Yeah, Chatham Kent police have also released some of the best speeding excuses they released in 2016 including someone saying they were trying to dry off a just-washed truck and a, per- and a person saying they were practicing lines for a play and must have been pushing on the gas. Okay. No. Yeah. All right, so... So, I remember... Um, th- I don't know why this story... This story, this is an older... It's an old 911 call. You can totally find it if you probably Googled it on YouTube. And it's this old lady... Calling 911, I believe it's in America. She's wasted out of her mind. She calls 911 to have the cops take her to the liquor store to buy alcohol. It is, it, it's the, one of the most ridiculous calls I've ever heard. Florida. And I, I don't, you know what? It might have been Florida, to be honest with you. I, I haven't listened to it in a couple of years, but I, I have never forgotten it because it was so absurd. And she was dead ass serious. She was just like, Listen, I I need a cop. I need to go to the liquor store. And this, the woman's like, "Ma'am, but do you have an emergency?" She's like, "Yeah, I I need to go to the liquor store." She was like, out of her mind. And um, yeah, that that's not the reason to call 911 for sure. One thing that's big on the internet right now are these Karen videos where like, if a person of color takes a, a walk through a neighborhood. Mm-hmm. Some white ladies calling the cops like just because they're there. Yep. 
it's been, that's happening a lot, so that's an abuse of the service as well. Like the guy uh, <clears throat> delivering a pizza. I saw that one last week. He was delivering a pizza, and she's like, you're not supposed to be here. What are you doing? And she literally ran after his car. She was insane. Such a Karen, like the mega Karen. Yeah, how did, how did when did middle-aged white women get so crazy in America? I don't know, man. I don't know. And, and you know what? And all Karens are bad. You know, I had a, a patient call in with that name and she's like I'm not a Karen though and I've gotten such a bad name like oh I feel so bad you know because everyone named Karen obviously isn't horrible it's just happened to be a multi it's a cultural funny thing but oh of course yeah yeah interesting all right and we've done our stories and now we're we're going to play uh, a game for the first time in this series uh the game's called True Crime. Would you, you've, uh, if you've never played the Would You Rather game, it's usually a choice between two, two options of things that you may or may not want to do. Um, but in this case, both options are pretty horrifying, and the choice is not so easy. Um, so I'm thinking, so I'll just like we do with the stories, I'll do one, and then you do one, and then I'll do one, and so on. Okay. So my first one is. Who would you rather have as a roommate, Paul Bernardo or Ariel Castro? Oh, God. <laughs> Jesus. <sighs> I'm going to say Bernardo only because I think I could take him. Yeah, he was a skinny little bastard. Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, I think I could I could overpower or or maybe – manipulate him a little easier than well, Ariel Castro. You'd be eating better too. Uh, Cause Ariel Castro would just feed you like cold egg McMuffins and exactly hamburgers and shit like that. And I, I don't think the Bernardos lived in filth, whereas Castro didn't clean his house. And so it was just disgusting. And uh, they, yeah. And I think Bernardo would have preferred, that you bathe, whereas that didn't seem to be important. It, you see, would you choose the same? Yeah, I think I would go with Bernardo. Yeah, uh, you just if you wait, you wait for the right time, and you can probably make a run for it. Whereas Castro, he just rigged up the whole house so that there were locks and shit all over the place. And, whereas Bernardo didn't do that. Yeah, exactly. That's 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 kind of what I'm thinking. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Okay. <laughs> Let's see here. Where did my list go? We'll start out with an with an easy and a, a not too horrible one. Okay. Would you rather go to prison for 10 years for something you didn't do or commit a serious crime and live in fear of being caught for your, the rest of your life? I'd rather be the innocent man because if you play your cards right, you can eventually prove your innocence. Cause, uh, and you're, you're going to have a lot of time in there to think about it. Every prison has a law library, too. That's true. So, yeah, and you can – so you can find – you can figure out how to prove that you were innocent. and Because ultimately, you're going to be going – you're going to spend so many hours just going over what happened and or what didn't happen. So, exactly. Yeah, so, yeah, I'd rather be a, the innocent guy, yeah. Mm, yeah, because living in fear for the rest of your life is ugh, way too stressful, and then you'd probably want to take your own life. So. Yeah, some of the offenders I profiled, you know, they kind of got to a point where they're like, it, it must be a lonely way to live, where like you, there's this horrible thing you did, you wish you could talk to somebody about it, but I mean, pretty much anybody is a mandated reporter when it comes to something like homicide. So you can't tell a psychologist, you can't, I don't know about defense attorneys, I don't know if they're obligated to report it, but uh, yeah, almost anybody, I mean, if somebody held on to that knowledge and didn't report it, they could go to, they can get in trouble for that. So you can't tell anybody, and yet um, you can't forget that you killed someone, I mean, that's a pretty, it's a pretty uh, heavy. Yeah, you're not forgetting it, you're not forgetting it. Even if it's even if you just killed one person, that's that's gonna stick. So um, yeah, I'd rather go for the innocent man. I'm afraid it's, of your next question. Yeah, you, you should be. Um, God, <laughs> who, I don't want to play this game anymore. 
Who would you rather carpool with, Ted Bundy or Ed Kemper? Ted Bundy. Really, Ted Bundy? Because, well, yeah, I guess, well. Kemper well, just freaking creeps me out. Like, I can't even look at him. Well, he, I think he usually used a gun, right? So he would. Yes. Whereas Ted Bundy used a crowbar. So if, if you, I guess if you went back in time and got into the, his Volkswagen bug and you knew right. him, you would know, like, he's got that in there. So you could watch him carefully. And if he's about to hit you, you could find a way to wrestle yourself out of it. And there was a woman or two who managed to escape. I know that there was one woman. Right, right. She got out of the car. Well, what was it with him that uh, she got out of the car? Or no, he got out of the car. That was with Kemper. Your thing of Kemper. With the gun in the car. Yeah, but there was, I think there was a woman who appeared on Dr. Phil. And so she got into Bundy's car and he took her to some like isolated area, which he often did. Somehow she managed to get out of it. But, but you know, she was one of the lucky ones, I guess. So I guess with him, there was, they were more likely to escape, whereas Ed Kemper didn't. He didn't wait. He would just shoot them. He, did, he, took, he took care of business. So. Ugh, ugh, ugh. All right, you ready? Yeah. In if being tortured, like tied up and tortured, would you rather have all of your fingernails pulled out or all of your teeth pulled out? Mm. I think I'd go for the fingernails. Um, I'm sure they must grow back. Well, actually, maybe not, because I, I, when I was younger, like 13, 14. I don't I think they would grow back. Well, I had problems with uh, ingrown toenails for years, and uh, so at one point, a doctor just removed one of the toenails, and uh, it didn't grow back like a nail is supposed to, but that area did kind of become, a, you know, solid with that kind of material, but it never looked normal. So, um, yeah, I mean, eventually... You could get you could get um, veneer or, you know, false teeth, though, but what would be more painful? Yeah, but that's expensive. Dent, you know, dent. Uh, oh gosh, yeah, that's true. Dentures. I mean, I'd rather get implants, but those are like four thousand dollars a piece. So, uh, or you could go the Marilyn Manson route and get chrome teeth. You never have to brush again. But uh, yeah, that's weird. But uh, no, I'd rather do the toenails. I think that would work out much better. Because fingernails, I, fingernails, not toenails. Nails, well, yeah, I know from experience that okay. the body will regenerate it somehow. Okay, so my next one is, um, you've just been murdered by a serial killer. Would you rather be defiled or dismembered? So you're dead. Which of those would you prefer? Mm. So I'm trying to think of what would be easier on my family since mm -hmm. I'm dead. Because if you're, if you're just defiled and they left you alone, then your family... They would still have a full body to bury or, or cremate. So I'm yeah. thinking that even – because I wouldn't care. Like I a, mean, it would be hard for my family, but at least they would have a full body. Like to, a, coroner, a coroner would know that you were defiled, but, you know, they wouldn't tell your son. Hopefully they, they wouldn't know the extent, you know, of the defilement. Yeah, that's true, yeah. 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 So may, maybe the necrophiliac would be smart enough not to leave any DNA behind, so to speak. So – Maybe they would never know. That would be really terrible in any way, shape, or form. <laughs> I'm not saying it would be good. I'm just saying better, <laughs> better, than, better than having an arm here and a leg there and your head used as sports equipment. And... Oh, Lord. Yeah, yeah. Cause then, and then the, and like in some of the things we do, they lose body parts and stuff like that. And yeah, I, my, I, want my, I want a full intact... Um, you don't want to be into the coffin looking like a scarecrow. Well, I'm going to be burnt. Oh, so. cremated. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. probably when it comes to dismemberment. Yeah. Although I don't really, I mean, whatever my family wants to do is kind of. The, yeah. Whatever it is. Well, yeah, in, that, in that case, you don't have a choice because you were just murdered. So. Well, let's see. Where did my, you, I keep losing my. Thing. Where'd it go? 
like do your next one because I have to find my the list I just had. Okay. Would you rather have acid thrown on your face like hydrochloric or muriatic at muriatic acid, which melts your skin, or would you rather lose a limb to an axe wielding maniac? Where's the acid being thrown? Uh, on your face, yeah. So, it, so you'll end up with like a horror movie face, like kind of maybe like Freddy Krueger, but probably with some skin hanging down too. Hmm. Limb. Because uh, there's this thing that happens in like Pakistan, Afghanistan, those areas, where like a young man will ask a girl to marry him, and if she rejects him, he might come along afterwards and throw a bucket of acid in her face. And I've seen a number of pictures of these women, and it, it's it's disfiguring forever. Think, yeah, like just, I, I yeah. would rather have a I would rather have a limb. Yeah, rather lose an arm or something like that. Yeah. Yep. Uh, I'd, I'd rather lose a limb because then you I mean I can get you can still I can still have my face which isn't completely horrific. You know I can get a prosthetic. Those are really come a long way. True. Yeah. yeah. So I'll, I'll go with that. What about you? Um, well, yeah, I guess, I mean, like if they, well, I'd rather, yeah, lose a limb. If, they, if it was a leg, well, uh, I guess, you know, I mean, there are people running, you know, relay races with these, these artificial legs now. Um, so yeah, they've definitely come a long way. And I mean, eventually they're going to come out with that Darth Vader technology where you can control your, you know, robotic arms they already exist to a degree, but they not, do. Yeah, like I once, an ex-girlfriend of mine, her son uh, lost half his leg when he was hit by a car, and um, he had a, a, an artificial leg, and it was partially computerized. So uh, I mean, he he still didn't like wearing it; it was uncomfortable. But yeah, they are they're making a lot of strides in that area. That's for sure. They are. So that's why I would choose to lose a limb and not Ugh. do the other thing. No, not worth doing that. Did you find your list? No, I'm still looking for my list. But in the meantime, I know we did this, but I'll, I just, this one's not in. Okay. Well, I thought of one because I know last time we were talked about which started this, would you rather be burned or drown? But, I mean, we said you'd rather drown, but here's another one. Would you rather be buried or live or drown? Buried alive. Because those, kind of, those are kind of similar, though. Yeah, well, drowning take, doesn't take as long. Whereas being buried alive, you're just uh, you're just going to starve to death and be thirsty and probably lose your fucking mind along the way. I mean, you could try doing that Kill Bill shit where you're pounding this, the box at the top of the box, unless you're just buried in dirt. Um, you could try that. I don't know how successful that would be in real life. Um, but yeah, with it, you know drowning, that just happens so quickly. So if your your boat capsizes in the middle of an ocean during a hurricane, you're probably not going to last five minutes. But being right. being buried alive, I don't know if a Texas funeral is a real thing. But yeah, that that's that's a fucked up way to go for sure. Good. I remembered one of my other ones too. So go ahead with your next. Okay, so you've just been murdered, and the killer wa wants a souvenir. So would you rather be stuffed by a taxidermist or have your skin made into clothing and home furnishing accessories like lampshades, a la Ed Gein? Definitely skin made into home furnishings and lampshades. Okay. Yeah. Hey, why not be <laughs> put to practical uses? After Hell yeah. I'd be, like, that would be kind of, I mean, it wouldn't be, like... Having a whole body of me taxidermy would be disturbing, but just my skin, like, made into art, kind of. I know it's creepy, morbid art, but, hey, it's, if it's mm. tanned and, you know, yeah. leathered, then why not? Do you have tattoos? I have no tattoos. Fun fact about me. Mm. I'm almost, well, my birthday's in 20 days. Then they'll never know it's you. Then they will never know it's you. Exact. Thank you. There you go. Nice, right. nice, beautiful skin lotion on it every day. 
lotion in the basket. You guys have the greatest. Don't, nobody come murder me and make lampshades out of my skin, please. My friend, my, children. Uh, my friend Krista, who is a listener. Hello, Krista. Her her body. Hi, is Krista. A, yeah, hi. Her body is an art gallery, so if they, somebody made a lampshade out of her skin, everyone would know who it was. But it also be it. It would also make it cooler though, and yeah, more artistic. Yeah. Yeah. She's I mean, gonna love that. Sorry, Krista. I don't want anybody to. Like, you know what? <laughs> well, I I, I kind of wonder if she might like it actually. I don't. Right. I know some of us are macabre. You know, we have a more macabre. I mean, I'm of, sure. Uh, she, I'm sure she would prefer to give consent. You know, she maybe of she. Of course. But uh, I don't know. It seems like something that might be up her alley. I'd have to ask her that. Okay, you ready? Yeah. This is for my men. Well, I guess I could go for a woman eat too, because we could both technically. Um, would you rather be scalped? Uh, this is alive. Would you rather be scalped or castrated? Uh, scalped? <laughs> That'll grow back. Yeah. I mean, no, they take your whole ass skin. Yeah, they do, but can't they like attach a skin graft or something? I don't know. I think it'd be pretty painful. Oh yeah. Well, I mean, well, I don't think you're, they'll probably put you under. But, uh, I mean, I'm already bald, so. <laughs> it's not like I'm going to be missing tons of hair, right? I mean. I mean, I don't, gosh, that's so horrible. <laughs> Why are we doing this game? Yeah, you, you can live, live with, that, with that skin, but that other skin, that's going to be a big problem. I mean, they do it to sheep and dogs and, and, and all other kinds of animals, and they live just fine. Well, the can't, live with, can't live without the old testes there. Yeah, the Bible gave us permission, right? I feel so bad for our men listeners tonight. Yeah. We yes. have really, we have desecrated the male genitalia in this episode, and I apologize. Well, I'm sure we'll, I'm sure we'll end up getting to the female genitalia at some point. <laughs> there's genital mutil- or female genital mutilation as well, guys. Well, yeah, there's that. I did do an episode about it, so. Yes. You did. Yeah, and it's really odd because they they have like celebrations for it, just like how um, they do it. They have those that they have the bris in the Jewish culture, and I Ugh. think I think there's a party. It's, uh, it's I guess it's the same concept, but they perform female genital circumcision uh, in such a barbaric way. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's not performed by someone who really knows what they're doing and Nope. Yeah, they often end up with with infections and retaining urine, and with people accusing them of getting pregnant and then killing them. It's a fucking. It's horrible. Thing. It's I can't even I cannot fathom because and it's such a sensitive area. It's just oh I can't fathom it. I can't. Yeah. I think we should um make this like a once a month segment. <laughs> <Really>? <laughs> Well, I can try. Or maybe uh, try other games. I I like it though. It's fun. It's something different. Okay. All so, right. On that note, uh, we're. I, I wanted to also say I have I've had a lot of people reach out and say really really kind things um about this segment lately to to Morgan and myself and I appreciate it. Um, and uh, I wanted to give a shout out to one of our listeners, Michael B. He's actually from Canada, and reached out to me on Instagram telling. <laughs> Remember I told the story about my Harry Potter figurines and he had a similar case <laughs> with his child. <laughs> so he commiserated with me on that and um, was really enjoying um, our segment. So wanted to give him a shout out and say thank you for reaching out. And I appreciate everybody being very supportive of me and my new trying to find myself in Deva. I hope I'm living up to your expectations a little better. Every every cancer has a collection. Cancers love to collect things. That is absolutely 100% true. I hate, I hate you for that. Yeah. Look in every cancer's home. There must be at least a CD collection, books, whatever, men with their baseball cards and stuff. Yep. Yeah. Uh, as I'm looking around my house, I'm thinking about all my collections. Oh, yeah. What else do you collect besides uh, that? Um, my very first – okay, fun story. When I was younger, I, I loved Garfield. And I had a Garfield collection and it got so large that my parents had an Airstream trailer out in the backyard that we just kind of stopped using. And 
the entire Airstream trailer was filled with Garfield things. And when I say, I mean, any possible thing you could possibly think of from books to figurines to uh, aprons, hats, Oh, yeah, they merchandised the shit out of it. Anything. I had every Garfield book, I all the comic. It was just everything Garfield. And uh, I actually, I think, what the, I, I think oh. it was put in a Have storage seen- unit and somehow lost, which is really devastating, but it's oh, probably for the best because I didn't need it. Your collection's getting destroyed. Or- My, see, oh. I'm not meant to collect shit. I need to take, need to listen to the universe telling Have- me I shouldn't collect things. Have you seen a comic strip called Garfield minus Garfield? Mm-mm. Oh, my God, it is so good. So what it is is they take all the strips with John Ar- Arbuckle in it, and yeah. they eliminate a Garfield, and it always makes it look like he's crazy or something. Oh, that's funny. I have to look, check that out. Like it's, it's so good. There's a lot of them out there. It's been it's been on the Internet for years. but I That's funny. It out. Yeah, it's pretty cool. I'll have to check it out. Yeah. Well, on that note, thank you very much for this week's true crime news thank you thank you morgan have yourself a nice night you have a great night i'm i'm thank you for cheering me up today i needed it yeah i'm gonna go to bed wearing a cup tonight (laughs) you're gonna have have, i know i might need a chastity belt even though we didn't talk about anything relating to my genitalia yet yeah stay safe (laughs) (laughs) stay safe bye talk to you next week you too bye-bye bye